Appreciate you all coming. We've uh, practiced twice with a, a group, 51 guys we picked off to start early. We've practiced twice with them in helmets only. Today will be the first day they have pads on. We're doing that uh, with them today and tomorrow. And then the older guys, the juniors and seniors, will show up on Sunday. We'll start practicing with them on Monday. So it's been fun to watch the new guys practice. They, they were a lot better yesterday than they were the first day. Uh, it's always fun to see how they handle the rigors of college practices as opposed to high school practices. So it's been a little fun, but I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Rob, what can you, what can you take away from just you know, a couple days in, in, in helmets? Is, is there a way to maybe look at what you see certain guys and think, okay, there is a lot more potential there than you thought before they got out on the field as a group? What you find out is we, we have uh, particular spots on our team that we think that young guys have to be able to play. Uh, for a depth factor as well as maybe even compete for a starting position just in a couple spots. But, but uh, for, number one, you can tell their athletic ability. Number two, you can tell how smart they are, how fast they pick up things. It doesn't matter how athletic they are. If they can't pick up assignments, they can't play and vice versa. They can pick up all the assignments, but if they can't run, change directions, and do all that kind of stuff, they're not going to play either. So the uh, uh, I don't know how long ago it was, but I've been coaching a long time. Way back when, this was a rule. You brought freshmen in early. All the freshmen got to practice three times before the veterans showed up, and it allowed you to check out the freshmen or the young guys. It allowed you to check them out and then allowed – them to have a chance to learn what they're doing so when the veterans show up they have a chance to compete so what we can tell is how athletic they are and how smart they are which is good I, I don't know I don't know yet the real telling deal is the first time we scrimmage when we go when we go full speed and they're all out there and there's certain guys that you understand there's certain guys that are going to play a lot of football for us that won't be scrimmaging but a whole bunch of those freshmen will be scrimmaging a lot so we'll be able to tell I, I would guess about the same number I think that we're going to need one of the freshmen or maybe two freshman DBs to play uh, that would be the only position I would guess we might have a linebacker play I would say the critical spot's the offensive line, but a true freshman's not going to play in the offensive line unless we got an all-pro, potential all-pro guy that showed up with it we don't know about. <laughs> but we'll have some redshirt freshmen play in the offensive line. Is this the youngest you offensive line you've had in a while? So many pulls to play? Uh, potentially, it's going to be the youngest offensive line we've had in a while. We, we went through this a couple of, uh, I don't know, not two years ago, three or four years ago, we went through the same thing where we had some guys that hadn't played very much starting the offensive line, and, and we struggled uh, the first part of the season and then played really good the second half of the season. I don't know where we should be ranked. I have no idea where we should be ranked. And preseason polls are interesting. They come out, there's a lot of just name teams that they pick because they assume they're going to be good again. Uh, if you're in a non-Power 5 league, your chances of being in the top 25 are minimal anyway. There are none from that. I think there's one. I think uh, South Florida. South Florida is in there. They, they're the only non-Power 5 team ranked in the top 25. And that's, that's normal. I mean, uh, non-Power 5 team has to play really, really well most of the season and beat some of their, uh, their favorite guys in order to be ranked in the top 25. If you're a name school and you're a Power 5 school, you get automatically get put in there and you have to lose three or four games before you leave the top 25. So that's just the world we live in. So that's, I'm glad we got some votes. That's nice. We got some votes. How, how confident has Christian Chapman been to your uh, squad and also Michael Holder? They've been really assets to your team. 
Well, Chapman's our starting quarterback, and he should uh, – should we're going to require him to do more than he's done in the past. So how well he plays has a lot to do with our success on offense. Michael Holder is one of our experienced wide receivers and has at times proved that he's a really, really good player, but he's had injury issues. So hopefully he can stay healthy for the whole season. Rocky, the play of the quarterback's obviously related to how the line plays, how the receivers battle. What does Christian need to do Not anything specifically to him, but we're going to require more out of the passing game, which uh, requires him to do more, but we think he can because of his experience. But here again, it's in order to take some of the pressure off of our offensive line. Instead of our offensive line having to block eight and nine and ten man fronts up there for the run, we've got to back them off some in order to throw the ball and catch it for you know more yardage than we did last year and beat them on some deep ones more often than we did last year in order to give our offensive line a uh, chance you know when you put more guys up there than you can block it puts a, it makes it really hard even though I think we have the best running back in the country it makes it really hard on the running back so our experienced receivers and our experienced quarterback have to do some more now the protection comes into it but you can you can keep tight ends in and you can keep fullbacks in to protect the quarterback. And then we've got to beat someone one on one and make them pay for it so they don't put eight, nine, and 10 guys up close to the line of scrimmage. How much potential do you think there is in the experienced receivers you talked about kind of raising their Well, we've got two experienced receivers that I think will have good years, plus we have some young guys. Uh, we got one back, Fred Trevelyan who has shown that he's got really good speed. And we've got a couple tall, young guys that have shown a lot of potential. So there's more chances that not only throwing it up and trying to get a deep ball in there, we have some possession type guys, but we also have some 6'3", 6'4", guys that can, we just throw it up there and see if they can out jump those 5'11 DBs. Even if you don't catch all those, and as long as it's not an interception, if it looks like it could have been caught, it backs people off. Just, just the fear factor backs people off. So we'll, we'll, we'll throw it down the field more than we did last year just to try to keep them from crowding the line of scrimmage until we think the offensive line can handle it. Can be the first option on kick returns, or would be Washington first, and then you'll see how things are going before you use the Our plans right now are, are to use someone else on kickoff returns because we assume or we're guessing that Rashad's going to get the ball a lot by handing it to him and throwing it to him. So he's going to take as many hits as he needs to take. Now there's specific games that if we think that we need a spark, uh, he might go back there. You know, we might slip him in early on. We put him back there. They're not going to kick it to him. OK, so he won't be the normal guy back there. And then we just might slip him in every once in a while, hoping that they actually kick it to him. <laughs> no, but he can stay in a group, so you can't tell he's out there. You talked uh, earlier today, and you've lived a life of having to prove your way into uh, a top 25. Knowing that, does that make those first three games that of this season just so crucial to letting the nation see what you're about and what you're still about? That's a very interesting question. So I'll try to answer it without being a smart ass. Uh, number one, we look at those games as opportunity games. I don't think we've proven as a program that we're a perennial top 25 team. And the idea that there's more pressure playing those two teams than any other game is ridiculous. The most important games on our schedule are league games. Our number one goal in this program is to win the league championship. The Stanford, no matter how much the media or anybody else wants to build up those two games, we have those guys on the schedule for the next six, eight, ten years because it gives us an opportunity. The idea that we have to win those games to be a quality football program are ridiculous. <sighs> okay, but that's the way it will be presented in the press. That's the way the press will present it. 
And then last year I was told that about the Cal game and we beat Cal and then it wasn't a big deal because Cal wasn't any good. I mean, so it's a, it's a no-win situation. They're on there so that we prove that we can compete at that level. But the value of our season based on whether we beat them or not, that's a ridiculous idea. Well, I can say it with more colorful language, <laughs> which I would like to do, <laughs> but I won't. Gotcha. A, a, dozen years when Tony, a dozen years ago when Tony Gwynn was San Diego State's baseball coach, the Aztecs had an exhibition against the Padres, and Tony Gwynn's comment before the game was, we're not going to win, but it's going to show these guys what it takes to get to the next level. Would you say that the, the two Pac-12 games, win or lose, are going to be – beneficial in terms of teaching your players? I don't think it has. I don't think there's any relationship to that. There's a completely difference from major leagues and college baseball. There's no difference between us in Arizona State and Stanford. None whatsoever. Now, will they be the favorites? Sure they will. There's a reason that they're on our schedule because we think we can beat them. Otherwise, we wouldn't put them on there. Now, if we went and played the Chargers, I'd say that we weren't going to win and we're going to learn what the next level is all about. <laughs> but, but they're no different. The Arizona State and Stanford, they're no different than we are. And we've got just as good a chance of beating them as they got of beating us. Now, we'll be the underdog for sure, but that's, that's okay. Rock, do you get the sense that I mean, coming out of the Mountain West Conference media days where you know, everyone was picking you guys uh, still to be the top dog, do you guys relish that, having the bullseye on your back and the fact that everyone I think it makes it harder to win because we're going to get everybody's best game. But I'd much rather be in that position than in the other position trying to prove that we're one of the top teams in our league. I, I like being one of the, I think our players like it. I think we're to the point uh, in our program now in the Mountain West Conference that we consider ourselves one of the favorites, and we've learned to live with that in a positive way, too. I mean, we don't, we don't it doesn't scare us. It doesn't worry us. It's just kind of fun to be on top. It means that you're going to have to play better more often, though. Mm -hmm. Question about John Barron. You asked him to do three different things. Does that have a necessity, or do you think he's earned the chance? And can he do all three things without wearing him out? We, he doesn't have to do all three things. We've, we've, got, a, we've got a punter, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, he's out there practicing. Hopefully he's good enough that John Barron doesn't have to punt. I'll tell you after camp's over if he's good enough so John Barron doesn't have to punt. But we don't plan on John punting, so he'll just do what he did last year, kick field goals and kickoffs. How important is it for you to fill the philanthropy gap that the Chargers have left in this town, and how does playing the Bermar fall into that? I, I don't think we feel any pressure of taking over what the Chargers did for the community. But it gives us, the, here again, it gives us an opportunity to do more than we have done in the past, which is, is really exciting for us as a program and really exciting for our players. I mean, our players are really excited about going up uh, to Miramar and scrimmaging there. We're sending the seniors up early so they can hang out with their football team. You know, they get to see, they'll see guys their age in uniform and all that kind of stuff. Maybe they'll realize how lucky they are and how important those guys are to to the rest of us. But I, I don't think we'll fill the gap, but I think we it gives us an opportunity to, to do more of that than we have in the past. And that's all fun and exciting. Is that something you wanted to do in years past? Well, I think, we, I think we did in the past with opportunities that were there. What has opened up is a lot more opportunities, a lot more things that we're, we can possibly do. I think over the next two or three years, you'll see a lot more things like this. I mean, we're just kind of getting our feet wet now, just finding out where they want to uh, partner with us and let us be part of what they're doing. Maybe more philanthropy in places where someone might be able to click an X in a ballot box. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> still have players on the team with military family background? Quite a few. Yeah, I don't think as many as that last time we checked, but there's still quite a few. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you mentioned the DBs also need, or being an area of concern. Is it the same as the offensive line where they just need seasoning, or what do they need to prove? 
Well, we have a lot of guys that we anticipate playing in the secondary that don't have the experience. Uh, but I think there's a completely different sense between them and offensive linemen. Because uh, offensive linemen, it's a maturity issue. They're, the closer I, I, I was taught this a long time ago, the closer you get to the line of scrimmage, the more of a man you have to be. Because the closer you get to the line of scrimmage, the bigger they are, the stronger they are, the more mature they are. You can, you can put an 18-year-old out there at wide receiver, and you can put an 18-year-old out there at DB, and as long as he's athletic enough, he's got a really good chance of playing well when he's young. When you're starting to talk about an 18-year-old offensive, 18-year-old offensive lineman against a 22- or 23-year-old defensive lineman, the defensive lineman has a huge advantage, even if the offensive lineman's bigger. You know, uh, we have we, when you watch us practice, you'll see that our offensive line looks the part. We're big, we're tall, we're strong looking, but half of them don't shave. <laughs> so, so when we play those teams that have experienced defensive linemen, they're at a disadvantage until they realize that there's no other way than to fight back. I mean, big kids out of high school have been playing against little tiny kids most of their lives. So they just either maul them or step on them or something like that. Now they're playing against guys the same size that are maybe a little bit more mature, a little bit stronger at the point of attack. Techniques are a little bit better. And just because he looks good in a uniform, that guy across from him doesn't care. And the guys across from him now are big enough and strong enough to knock him around a little bit when he's never been knocked around before in his whole life. So? I think the hardest thing for all offensive linemen is to adjust on the move. Uh, all our offensive linemen, if you tell a defensive lineman to stand right there and stay right there, they'll be just fine. But when they, when they start moving on them, where they have to adjust their steps and all that and still put their face in the right place and put their hands in the right place, that is a technique that is learned after repetition, 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 repetition. It just happens naturally. They don't have that. And the only way you get that is to play. Rocky, a, a pass is not necessarily a deep throw to a wide receiver. You can get a halfback or a tight end over the middle. Given the receiving stats of Rashad last year, do you think that he's enough of a threat that it might open things up for Truxton and Micah a little bit? Make things I, I think Rashad catches the ball well enough to be a threat. I mean, DJ Pumphrey was our leading receiver, I think, last year or maybe the last two years. It's funny, you get to, if you read the articles from uh, Philadelphia, how they're finally using him right. They're using him in the slot and they're throwing him passes and all those sort of things. That's the same thing Coach Horton did with him here. Exactly the same coach thing Coach Horton did with him here. He was our leading receiver. I, I think Rashad is a different kind of receiver. I think uh, Pumphrey was more of a slot receiver. Rashad maybe is a little more out in the flat, catch it and run over you, or out in the flat, and if you get too tight, turn it up the sideline and catch a long pass, because Rashad's faster. He's not, as, he's not as elusive, but he's faster and he's bigger, and he catches it just as well. So I, I think he'll get the ball thrown to him a lot, just maybe a little different than the last uh, that Pumphrey did. Easy. We win every practice. I want you to know that we win every practice. <laughs> so if you so if you count the if you count those before our first game, we're twenty nine and zero. <laughs> oh, that's sad. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, it sounds terrible. It, it's really sad, and I don't. I do know this from experience, not personal experience, but I do this when you tear the ligaments in your knees, especially like all of them, uh, big guys have a much harder time than little guys coming back because they're carrying so much weight. Uh, it's, a, it's really a sad deal, I mean, because we, we thought he was going to make the team for sure, and there was a chance he was going to start for him. And I'm sure he's more disappointed than anybody in this room and more disappointed than we are, but 
I mean, he's one of our favorite guys, so we feel bad about it, sure. Haven't yet, no. Well, I, I talked to all of them this summer when they got done with their mini camps and all those kind of things. They all came back here for the four weeks between mini camps and they started camp. They were all around here. So I got to talk to all of them. They all were pretty excited about their chances and their opportunities and the reports back that it, all of them are doing well. Well, he's one of those safeties that we're talking about. He's one of those young guys that hadn't played. He's got a world of ability. He can run fast. He can change directions. He likes to hit you. Uh, but the experience factor is there again. But the, I'm going to say this again. Our safeties, young safeties, have a lot better chance to play well early than our offensive linemen do just because of the maturity factor. So uh, we need two or three. We have six young safeties. All of them have a lot of ability. We need two or three of them to play well and play well this year for us to be good. He's one of them. There's so much communication that has to go on back there, right? Yeah, it, with the invention of the spread offense, the communication in the secondary is probably tripled or quadrupled or maybe even more than that because we do a lot of coverages that are based on formation. So as the formations change with motion or shifts and all that kind of stuff, there has to be communication between four or five guys back there or six or seven guys if you count the linebackers back there so they all go the right places. And obviously, if you have nothing but experienced guys back there, they don't even have to tell each other. They just automatically do it. So there's more chances of us giving up some deep balls this year than it was last year because we had nothing but veterans back there last year. There is, there is a simple factor. If you're making too many assignment errors, just blitz everybody and play straight man coverage <laughs> because they can count. I got one, you got two, I got three. They got, I mean, you can count. Yeah. Now the other team has an advantage when they know you're doing that too. 